You can see all the rooms are filled. Usually these halls are very neat and empty. And now you can see uh, there's patients everywhere. So the volume is down. It's a big change from last week. No patients in this hall at all. It is a beautiful sight to see. Well, that are before and after from Mount Sinai Hospital of Queens, one of the hardest hit places in the country, finally getting some relief. I want to bring in our guest who will be fielding your phone calls along with myself and answering your questions. You see the number at your screen, 888-766-2428. Dr. Philippe Serrano, he is an emergency room physician with the Mount Sinai system, also an assistant professor of emergency medicine and that before and after is your life here. Um, it's tangible, right? I mean, you don't see bodies lined up in the hallways anymore. Um, you can breathe. Right, and, and I think we're seeing that across the city and thankfully in, also in places like Queens and, and Brooklyn, which are in the Bronx as well, which are the hardest sure. hit. I, I work in Manhattan and we were a little bit luckier than most in that we were not as crazy busy, but even in our setting, we're seeing the numbers of coronavirus patients drop significantly. Um, we have seen playing out nationally, we'll get into it, this, we all feel this itch to get back out there, but I saw from the head of the CDC today that he's concerned that the fall could even be worse than what we went through already. It doesn't just speak to, doctor, how little we still know about this virus, and I mean, obviously, we'll get to it with our audience too, just this compelling need for testing just to see where we are right now. Yeah, and, then, and that's the really big struggle that we're dealing with. And, and I think the big criticism that we've had with the response to the virus from our government is the lack of widespread testing, just because we don't really know who's had it and who hasn't had it. And we don't know what percentage of the population has already been sick and recovered. So yeah, I think I make a mistake sometimes that we everyone assumes why testing is so important. If you could explain from somebody on the front lines why knowing who has and who hasn't, and then going forward, having the availability of this testing and tracing, why that's important. And it's not some political soundbite, but from a medical perspective, why does it matter so much? And it's really important as, in terms of public health, right? So for making a decision for the individual patient, I, you know, if you're healthy and you have coronavirus, we're not gonna change what we do. But if we know that you had it and you know that you had it, and that cha can change your decisions as to what you do. So if I, you get diagnosed with coronavirus today, then you know it's very important for you to quarantine, uh, much more than even if, you're, if it's unknown. And if you know you've had it before, then maybe it's an, um, one of the options we can have to let people go back out into the world. Um, and the tracing part of it, explain how that is, because we know this isn't gonna go away once we do release people out there. I mean, we're seeing hot spots in different parts of the country and this never disappears completely. But to be able to identify areas and then contain it, talk about the tracing part of it. So that's something that, that we've tried to do, right? Is figure out where some of these hotspots are, like that prison in Ohio, I don't know if you've talked about that. Um, but finding out where the big clusters of cases are here in New York, a lot of them were nursing homes. Uh, and being able to focus our efforts in preventing spread from those places. It's very difficult, however, to do that if you completely open the economy, unless we have draconian measures like what countries like China did. Mm. I'm going to go to the phone lines right now and some specific calls um, with questions to the medical field. Let's go to James. He's calling us from Fleetwood. James, thanks for holding your question for the doctor. My pleasure. And first of all, uh, thank you, doctor, for your service. Uh, this is a Something we always say to people in the military, but uh, we have a whole new definition for it now. Thank you very much for what you do. Uh, my wife happens to be a physician. Uh, she's medical director of a multi-site uh, medical um, uh, center in the Bronx. And what we do, I just devised a plan, and I just want to get your opinion about it. When she comes home in the evening, if she hasn't seen patients all day. She only sees patients a couple times a week, a couple days a week. Most of the time she's doing administrative work. Uh, but still, it's the whole, the whole medical environment. When she comes in, the first thing she does, comes in the first door, strips down off of everything, leaves the clothes. Oh, I'm sorry. I think, I think we, we lost change. But I think I know where he's going with yeah. this, is to this, um, how do you do this uh, move when you get home? Talk about you personally. Sure, of What's course. your... Now, thank you, James, for your kind words. And, and yes, personally, I do the exact same thing. Uh, 
and I understand where your wife is coming from, right? So I get in the door and I take off my shoes. I leave them right by the door. I, you know, take off my scrubs or whatever I'm wearing, uh, and I take a shower immediately as soon as I get home. Uh, as much as you protect yourself at work, it, it really is, uh, it's gonna be in your hair, it's gonna be in your clothing, and we don't really know, even now to this point, how much uh, the virus survives on these surfaces or how contagious it is. We have to be as careful as we can, and so I, I appreciate what your wife is doing, and I, and I think that I am doing the same thing. Let's go next to Lynette. She's calling us up from Harlem. Uh, thank you for joining us, Lynette. Go ahead. Hi, um, I want to thank you also for everything that you do. Uh, my question is, um, I work at a hospital, and I know that a couple of my coworkers um, tested positive. They've been home. They're back to work. Um, I'll be going back to work soon, recovering from bronchitis. But I just want to know, is there anything extra, you know, you can try to do when you're working with people who had tested positive and working in the nursing station where everyone is kind of, you know, as I guess as far as part as it can be, but still, you know, kind of close because of, you know, how we're working. I just want to know if there's any extra precautions or something that we that we could take. Lena, thank you for your question. And, and that's very appropriate. And, and I appreciate what you're going through because I we all have the same concerns when we're at work every day. Uh, I think the most important thing you can do is really, really, really watch your PPE. So make sure that you have your N95 mask on at all times. Try not to touch it, try not to adjust it. I know it's uncomfortable. Uh, wash your hands all the time, change gowns every time you see a patient, take off and on your gloves carefully, have an area where you take your, uh, your gown on and off that is safe and is far away from your work area. And I think importantly also remind your coworkers to do the same thing, right? You are somebody who's high risk having had bronchitis and it's very important for you to be as safe as you can. Uh, I want to get to our next caller, Kathy, uh, who's calling us from Yonkers. And Kathy, I understand you have lupus, and I want you to be able to ask the question to the doctor. I'm, I'm curious, though, a specific drug in the market um, that specifically treated lupus patients was discussed by the president as others as maybe some miracle cure. It hasn't turned out to be. In fact, tests have said otherwise. Have you found it difficult at all in the last few weeks getting chloro... Help me out, doctor. Dr. Hi, yeah. Thank you very much. Easy for him to say. <laughs> Have you found it hard to get that drug that uh, helps you treat um, your condition? Not at all. As a matter of fact, I just got a refill in Rite Aid. And um, the only thing is now I have to get a code from my doctor. And she had to call it in, um, you know, the code. Other than that, I didn't have a problem. We never have a pro had a problem before, but because of everybody's test, you know, getting the stuff for the trial, um, you know, I had to get a code, and that was the only thing. And I'm sorry, you had a question for the doctor. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, I'm on Plaquenil already, doctor, and I've been out for the last two months because my, you know, when it started, my doctor didn't want me near it, so I'm going back to work for the first day on Friday. My question is, being that I'm taking the Plaquenil already, am I kind of buffered already from the COVID patients or not? You know, Kathy, unfortunately, it doesn't look like Plaquenil is doing very much uh, to treat the disease. Uh, it looks like the, some initial studies may have just been chance more than anything. I think we're still trying it in some of the sicker patients, but the results we're getting are not fantastic. Uh, so I would say just take the same precautions as everybody else, and especially with you having lupus, be extra careful uh, when you're around the people who have coronavirus. Thank you. And I know this next question from Nathan still gets asked a lot. Um, and Nathan, if I understand your question to the doctor, you want to know that if you feel healthy, could you still have the virus, correct? Yes, if you don't have any of the symptoms, no, no chest pains and no uh, fever and all that kind of thing, can you still have the effect? That's the hardest thing with this virus, actually, that I've noticed is the number of patients who come in with completely unrelated complaints to the emergency department. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had somebody who had a stab wound. Uh, we had another person who was in an accident with his bike and broke his ankle, and they both were positive with coronavirus and had absolutely none of the symptoms that you would expect. And it turns out from some places that are testing people that up to 60 to 70% of patients who are testing positive for coronavirus have no symptoms that would suggest it. So it, it's making it very tricky to decide who has it and who doesn't without specific testing. It, and that's the last word. We're going to come back with much more on the other side of the break. Testing. 
if we don't get testing, and this is where I say speak loudly, say, make your elected officials know, if we don't have testing, and every governor that can hear me today is desperately trying to do it, but the federal government has to be involved here especially, and we'll get into some of the trickier parts of testing, but without the federal government's involvement here for the supply chain, this will not work here. We'll jump to a quick break. When we come back, many more of your phone calls. The doctor will stay with us. You see our toll-free number. Join us.